Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program, we have a band called Tess in the Details. They're local, they're from San Francisco. So uh, I'm excited to talk to them about con uh, playing concerts locally and going to a lot of shows in the area, how they got their start, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, so we'll bring them in in just a minute. Um, it's led by, uh, a band led by Tess Stevens and uh, they have a uh, debut EP that came out uh, just last month, uh, November 14th. They're going to play a show at Bottom of the Hill on December 15th. Uh, that's right, right around the corner uh, and a great place to play a show. They played there before earlier in the year and, uh, and put on a really good performance and they're coming back to, uh, uh, to play another show. So uh, we're going to bring them in in just a moment. Before we do, I'll catch up on a little bit about what's going on in my world. Uh, the holidays are coming very soon. Uh, dreading that a little bit. It's always, you know, seems to be the same sort of thing where it's like a, a scurry to the finish and spend, 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 spend. Continue to need to get gifts for the the kids and uh, and uh, and make sure I have enough under the tree. You, you know, even have a box sticking out in the corner that's a, a gift for a kid. And I don't think they know or really focus on it really what's, you know, stuff still in boxes and needs to be wrapped. And uh, and so I need to get on that. I'll probably do that this weekend and, uh, and make that happen. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's a constant fixation is like not enough. I'm not spending enough time to slow down and look around, see what my kids need or want or kind of get personalized gifts for, for them. I've gotten some stuff, but never feels like enough. And then you got to do the stockings and, uh, and everything else, and, you know, that's, uh, that goes along with that. Uh, there's also an elf that needs to be moved on a shelf uh, every day, apparently. And uh, that's a thing I have to remember now. And because my son is, you know, kind of fixated on that a bit and, you know, not enough to really be obsessed about it, but enough to kind of, if I don't do it, then something will be wrong. Right. So, uh, so that's kind of what's happening around here, but he's really excited about the holidays right now. I think he's doing downstairs, doing a, a, a word search, holiday word searches. So, and listening to Christmas carols. Um, so he's, he's really excited about it. We've watched the holiday movies, of course, Home Alone, uh, and then Home Alone 2. And uh, last night we watched A Christmas Carol, which is reminiscent of my childhood, the one with George C. Scott. That's the one I grew up on. So uh, I, I enjoy sharing that with my son and that he, he likes it. Um, and then I'm looking forward to the road trip that I have with my daughter at the end of the month, uh, where we're going to go down south and see something corporate, uh, Andrew McMahon's first band, which is uh, going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to spending time with my daughter, getting, you know, I've seen Andrew do play something corporate songs over the uh, past years, but not with the original lineup since like 2010 or 2012. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. I'm getting out duck hunting too. Uh, it's the duck hunting season. Uh, so that's a, an active hobby of mine, but it hasn't been that productive recently. It's been a real slow year so far since the opening day hunt. And so I'm hoping my hunt tomorrow will uh, be productive uh, and that lots of birds will be flying around. I'll get to bring home uh, a couple at least. So um, those are the kind of things that are going on in my world and things that I'm uh, looking looking forward to. So winding out the year, uh, I'm not big on New Year's resolutions. I don't do that uh, very much. Uh, so I, I mean, I just try and really take care of myself throughout the year. And that's kind of my, my focus. Um, so as long as I'm doing that, I feel like I'm in a, a pretty good spot. Um, and uh, so nothing really crazy on that front. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. I, I don't know. Got to, might have a couple interviews here and there. We'll we'll see. They're they're going to be pretty scattered over the uh, next month or so as to uh, when they actually happen. It's kind of the slow time of year for band interviews, but also I try and take a step back a little bit and slow down myself so that I can um, just focus on uh, other things that are around because I I take on too much. Uh, so. I want to spend time with my hobby of duck hunting, really make sure I uh, dive into that enough. I want to uh, focus on my kids uh, and, uh, and really just enjoy um, what's around. So with that, I think uh, we should bring in uh, Tess Stevens. She's in, in the lobby. So let's uh, bring, bring her on in. And um, I believe uh, Gideon Berger, uh, Berger is on uh, in the lobby as well. So um, they are Tess and 
the uh, uh, the details. Let's bring them on in. Hello. Hello, Gideon. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Steve? I am doing very well. And uh, and Tess, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I I'm good. Thanks for doing the interview on sh uh, short notice. Our pleasure. Of course. Thank you for you know caring and reaching out and making this happen. We're stoked. Oh, of course. I mean, uh, I've interviewed so many bands with Ravi over the years, and they, I mean, they all if they bring bands on to, uh, uh, you know, rep, if they're representing bands, I know they're going to be good. And so, um, so you've made a good choice by uh, by working with them. Awesome. Cool. Cool. We're glad. Yeah. Yeah. They're the, they're the best. Yeah. So so we have a lot of a lot to talk about. Uh, so um, uh, we can start kind of at the the beginning of uh, of your band and. Uh, and how you two met. I know Tess kind of you kind of went into this venture as kind of uh, kind of identifying as a solo artist, but it kind of came out to be something else. Why don't you tell me kind of the, the story of how you and Gideon met? Uh, yeah, so I was looking for a place to record some songs that I had tucked away for a while. And I found this amazing studio called Modern Tone Studios in Lafayette, California. And um, it was like the fifth or sixth studio that I had like talked to interviewed whatever and I hadn't really clicked with anybody yet nobody really got it and I met uh, Jacob Light who produced this record and um he and I were just like instantly understood each other um he listened to the songs and then he had stuff to say about the songs and specific things he wanted from the songs and how he wanted it to sound and a lot of the other people in the area were like they're amazing I'm gonna make you the next Gwen Stefani and I'm like you're full of shit um Jacob like talked to me like a musician would talk um so I trusted uh him like immediately and then we started throwing some ideas back and forth and he's like who's gonna play drums on this record you have a drummer in mind because like I can track bass like we're good with that but like you need a drummer and I'm like I was thinking I could play drums because like I played drums in a punk band like 10 years before this and I certainly was not going to make the cut. He goes, I know this guy. He's been a friend of mine for, you know, a decade and he's a studio drummer and he's been in the, these bands and he sends me this band useless ID and I'm like, these guys are fucking huge. What are you talking about? He's in this band. What is going on here? And it was Gideon and he came through the door and we just started talking shit immediately and he was so much fun and um four years later we have this album and this band and uh it's just kind of like a, a destiny sort of thing so I'm, I'm very thankful that i went with modern tone because if i didn't i wouldn't have we wouldn't be here so hey good just a good decision and uh so you mentioned that the songs were you already kind of had them in in place like you were they written what what state status were they in when you kind of uh, went to the studio um, so this was for Patient 139, like the e the solo EP. So mm -hmm. um, I had them all written. Uh, they'd been hanging around. A couple ones were new and a couple I wrote in like college. Um, but we put some polish on them and, and they changed into something that I, you know, became really proud of. Um, and then after that, um, me and Gideon started writing songs together and throwing things back and forth and then ended up with enough songs to go, oh, we should probably record this. It's like, this should probably come out. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me about Patient 139. Who Who is that? They, that was released right before COVID, right? And uh, uh, tell me tell me about that. Um. Yeah, so um, I, I had a little uh, moment of, I, call, I like to call it a moment of clarity, um, where I needed to like get my mental health in order. And um, Patient 139 was kind of the result of that, like working through a lot of that stuff. And um, by the time I realized that like music was the thing holding me together, I had taken like a very long break. Um, those songs just needed to be recorded. I was like, I'm going to invest my money and my time and my effort, like all the savings I had. I was like, I'm going to the recording studio. Like th This is the only thing I want to do ever. Um, so, yeah. And then we, we put it out in 2020 and everything kind of went from there. Yeah. And, and Gideon, tell me about from your your perspective, when uh, when you met Tess, like what, what was that like? And when you heard the, the kind of uh, where the songs were at and what 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 your involvement was going to be? Sure, sure. Um, so I had no clue of Tess. I didn't know her. And then uh, our mutual friend, Jacob Light, the guy who produced uh, her EP and our album later, who's a close friend of mine, we played in bands together uh, years prior to that, reached out to me and he's like, hey, this girl came through the door. She has some songs. This is good. 
you should come and check this out. She's looking for a drummer. You should play on this. And uh, um, Jacob is one of those people that I really trust. I really value their opinion. And when he called me up and he's like, hey, I need you to listen to this, I listen. And indeed, he wasn't lying. Uh, the music was fantastic. Four songs, straightforward, really catchy, well-written melodies, uh, lyrics that are also approachable, but also makes you think. Um, and when I got in my car and drove to the studio and actually met Tess, I was like, okay, cool. We're having a laugh. Like, this is fun. I've done a bunch of sessions and always, oftentimes it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a session. It's like a very business uh, kind of relationship. But over there, like from the first moment, like we're friends, like we, uh, we uh, hit it off and it was fun. Um, so we did that whole run. Like we did the recording and that was like right when COVID became a thing. So we're like, okay. So, and I immediately realized, okay, this is not going to, you know, turn into anything like real. However, in the background, Tess promoted the EP and pushed it and got popular and people cared about it and everything. So throughout the pandemic, we also started a conversation about, hey, I actually wrote a few songs, you know, I actually, actually have these things. And we started the, the whole process of back and forth. I'm, I'm sending ideas, Tess sending ideas. We like work on these songs we formed them and then we're like at some point right we have like 15 songs like this is uh is this the the a word are we are we working on an album and um and again like once we realized there's a bunch of songs we uh found ourselves in lafayette in modern tone studios with jacob yelling at us again and producing this this thing uh, which was amazing, amazing experience. And uh, I hope it translates to the record itself that we uh, we were having a lot of fun and we really cared about um, every little piece that went into this record from the songwriting to the lyrics, to the melodies, to the takes themselves, to the recording process, how we placed everything. That's what uh, basically originated the, the whole details idea, uh, like the attention to details kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's where we're uh, where we are today. Yeah, I like it. And uh, and Gideon, you've been in bands for like uh, twenty years or so, right? And so uh, I'm I'm curious uh, with the, the tell me about the dynamic with a, a female led band. Have you been in? Uh, have you had any bands with uh, females before, or uh, is this is test your first? Good question. Um... This is the first time I'm I'm in a band in an actual live or. I, I, collaborated with a lot of female artists before again on their session work but this is the first time I'm actually in a band with a female front person a leader of the band um has a lot of has a lot of pros has a lot of cons of course it changes the dynamics that you like you can uh, deny it uh but this is awesome this is great this is not a one of those uh no 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 you can't lift amps or no 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 you have to walk on eggshells or anything no uh, this uh, this rock chick has a thick skin and she's experienced and she knows how it's how it works and she's like how should I say it? one of the, one of the guys kind of thing um, and it's awesome because the regardless of gender and all that's that whole conversation like the fundamentals are there she knows how to hold the guitar she knows how to sing she knows how to rock everything else is you know uh, yeah, so extra yeah. It's all there, and uh, and so Tess, tell me ab about working with Jacob. I mean, uh, Gideon mentioned you know, him yelling at you and all, but what did what did he bring out of uh, of you both in, uh, in terms of creating the album? Jacob is a meticulous individual. He is somebody who does not let things slide. Like uh, you're a little flat, you're doing it again. Your palm mute is not precise, you're doing it again. And there was a point in the record where like I had to stop and go practice the fucking guitar like because I wasn't gonna finish it I'm like I was gonna give up and if he had not like pushed me through that um I wouldn't be playing guitar the way I do now I wouldn't be able to front this band the way I do now like um it was a do or die kind of moment like um are you gonna be this person or are you gonna just continue to be okay like 60 percent like no nah, I want to be 125 percent I want to change the percentage so Jacob I think um if anybody is looking for someone to really push you and hold you accountable for your shit like every word of the lyrics like there is not a single word on that album that was arbitrary um 
like get to he he would encourage stuff like get to the point like you guys are dancing around this thing like what are you guys trying to say like then say it you know so so it really pushed and um there was you know awesome stuff in the studio where there was like a lot of friction like Gideon and him would be arguing about a harmony for like half an hour and I would sing it three different ways and nobody could decide and then until it felt right that's when we went with it and then everyone feels awesome after like it's those moments of like tension that create I think good records because you can easily go in there with your buddies and dick around and go oh our songs amazing we're great but it takes a true collaborator and a true friend to tell you when you're not where you should be um so I think that that's something that um can be intimidating for a lot of people but he doesn't let you make mediocrity like he he's the kind of person who that does not slide in his studio and it's if you look at like uh the the best of the best that's the quality they all share they are dogged in pursuing the best sound possible so we're very very grateful um to have worked with him on that yeah yeah that's that's great and uh and Gideon um I want to ask you about uh, Canary. You you said Canary is actually the first time I dared to say, "Hey, I think I wrote a song," and the immediate response was, "And get fucked." Uh, <laughs> so that was a that was another first for you. So tell me tell me about that uh, and the breakthrough with Canary. Sure, sure. Um, so until today, if you ask me what kind of instrument I play, I play drums. Yeah. But you you also play guitar, and you had a mean ass beard too. I saw like you had you like. That beard is something to be proud of, by the way. Yeah. Hopefully you just took it off and have it on a wall or something because it's it was brilliant. Of course, it's, it's here in the in a case, in a flight case with a lock. <laughs> so, you can dance in it every day. Yeah, uh, my go-to instrument is drums. However, throughout the years, I was always attracted and, and like fascinated by guitars. At some point, like five years ago, I actually pulled the trigger, bought a guitar, started playing it a little bit. I'm still trying to play it. Um, but I wrote a song. I felt like I recognized, like, hey, I think this is this is is this the S word? Did I wrote a song? And um, I was always very um intimidated, shy. I call it whatever you want. To, like to sh to share it with the bands I played in. I never brought it to a band. I always played in band, but I never dared to be like, I wrote a song. Here's the, the song. Nah, I never did this that thing. Um, so. When we worked on Runaway, this is the first time actually, hey, I recorded the demo. I think this is a song. I send it over to Tess. 30 minutes later, she responds with that song, with lyrics, vocals, and all that stuff. And I'm like, damn, this, this thing comes to life. Um, and from there, we worked on a bunch of other songs. But well, one thing led to another. And I, we a few weeks later, we actually ended up in the studio working on these songs, producing them, recording them stuff that we worked on together, stuff that maybe I came up with a chord progression for the chorus, the verse, maybe both. We worked on it, we created it, but I'm like shocked because that was the first time I'm contributing to a song beyond the drums, of course, and maybe like a little simple arrangements here and there, uh, which was really amazing. And as a musician, that opens a whole new, uh, maybe even part of your brain to like understanding how how did that part of the song uh, is being involved? Like, how do you write the music? How do you write the chords? Tricks you can do makes it turns you into a better like musical communicator. Uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. It really again, and, and then one thing led to another, and I start playing more instruments and like a little bit of bass, a little bit of more guitar, and um, yeah, it's it's cool. It's fun. It's uh, I I um, I'm very thankful and appreciative to be the in the opportunity where somebody actually gave me the opportunity to bring my music and now it's on vinyl it's there it's in print right so <laughs> um i want to go back and i want to kind of ask you both about your your childhoods a little bit and kind of the music that you were raised on um and i guess we'll start with tess but uh your your dad was more uh, rock and roll like classic rock your mom was more pop so tell me kind of about that blend for you and kind of how did that build your found foundation um, yeah, my, my dad's an odd person. Um, he, he had me listening to everything from like Bruce Springsteen to like the Dixie Chicks, now the Chicks. Um, yeah. so I listened to a lot. Uh, we listened to like Cher a lot. 
which was odd. That was from your dad's side? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no. my dad, Like I said, an odd man um, in, in a red Cadillac. I remember listening to Cher in the early 90s, just like sitting there going, wow, I... I don't know what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But he was always very like, listen to the lyrics. Like, let's analyze the lyrics because my dad's a writer. So it was like, this metaphor means this and this thing means that. And, and, and I would just go, oh, wow. Okay. That's really powerful and interesting. And then my mom just loved, you know, pop radio. So we listened to like Madonna and Tina Turner and um, the bangles and all that stuff. So then I got this like really sweet tooth for melody. Um but like the the my like cringy like villain origin story is like when yeah. I was getting re like ready for school in the morning in like 2007 um I heard uh, American Idiot by Green Day like I wasn't even yes. facing the television and I just heard like the opening chords and I was like who what is that and then I watched this video and I see like the imagery of like the flag and these three like short dudes with eyeliner on and I'm like what is this and then that kind of was like my gateway because it had this amazing pop melody um but then it had these huge guitars and like it that album's mixing is like something that hits you in the face immediately so um oh, yeah. It was kind of the gateway uh, for me. And then, of course, all those other bands, you know, in that area, uh, like Alkaline Trio and um, Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, like that was where I started. And then I somehow ended up really loving bands like, you know, The Clash and The Ramones and The Sex Pistols and everything in between and like Joy Division, Post Punk you know Depeche Mode the Killers like like it, anything that had a guitar and a good melody I was just obsessed with so um I I'm the oldest so I kind of had to like set the cool standard and no one listened to me anyway none of my siblings but I think uh that was kind of like the the formative thing of like I have to pick up a guitar like I asked for a guitar immediately after yes. hearing that album um so yeah yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good story, and uh, there's a lot more you said that I want to come back to because uh, I want to I want to being as you are uh, from the Bay Area, I want to talk to you about shows and and venues and all of that. Um, but but we'll finish the origin story piece first, and then come back. So Gideon, why don't you tell me your your origin story? I know your bro uh, your brother has a band too. Were you uh, were you both kind of raised in a musical environment? Sure. Um... Yes and no. So yes, my brother, both of my brothers, actually, uh, I'm the youngest uh, out of the three. Both of my brothers played in bands uh, since ever. One brother played in black in a black metal band, the other played in punk bands. Um, the one who played in punk bands still does it till this day. Uh, it's Ishai from Useless ID, who plays in a bunch of like punk, punk rock, hardcore and heavier bands. Um, so yes, I grew up in a musical home. Like there was always music. Uh, in the you know the the living room and in the rooms and such, um, so I was exposed to like punk rock and all that stuff at an early age, which uh, which is a blessing and a curse you could say. But uh, yeah, it was always there. Uh, having a no, I didn't grow up in a musical house. Uh, there was never a ton of support for being a musician. That's not the type of house home I grew up in. It's not like a I grew up and people put drumsticks or a guitar in my hand. It wasn't like that. But uh, we snuck outside of the house and then we went to play in bands. Um, so it was, uh, it was great to have that exposure to that, uh, subculture at an early age, like, uh, growing up, listening to anything from Metallica to Bad Religion, you know, it was, uh, it was awesome. Um, and till this day, again, till this day, me and my brother, we have a, a great relationship. We send music back and forth to each other. We ask for each other's opinion. Um, I actually... Played with him in Useless ID for for a few years, which was awesome. That is that was a fantastic experience to see uh, to operate and play in a band of that scale and go on those kind of tours and learn a lot of the do's and don'ts. Um, so yeah, very very thankful for the uh, for the childhood I had and the, the home I grew up in. Yeah. And where'd you grow up? Um, so originally I'm from a little city in Israel called Haifa. Um, but yeah, uh, born and raised in Israel and moved to the U.S. in 2016. Yeah, and you, you got to play shows in Israel fair, uh, fairly recently also, right? What was that experience like? Yeah, so it, it's a funny story. Before joining Useless ID, uh, I played in a band called Kill the Drive, which was also um, active overseas. We've done tour uh, in the U.S. and Japan, things like that. Earlier this year, uh, I was visiting home. I was visiting Israel, and I realized the guitar player in that band was Jacob. 
they are produced right away. I was visiting Israel and he was visiting about the same time. And we immediately started connecting the dots and we we're like, uh, should we do the R word and have like a reunion show kind of thing? And we started like, and my, my um, statement was, if it gets too hard, I'm not doing it. And challenge by challenge, everything like got unlocked super easy. And I'm like, damn it, shit, damn it. flight booked, location uh, secured, promoter, everything like got lined up. And we're like, okay, I guess we're playing it. A week or two weeks before I, I went to Israel, Ishai, my brother, was having a release show, was planned to have a release show about that same time. And I was like, cool. So I'm going to do the Kill the Drive show. And a couple of days later, I'm going to get drunk at the venue and like celebrate with them. My brother reached out to me and he's like, yeah, so Corey, our drummer, he had a little accident. He broke his elbow. Um, can you play drums? I mean, you're playing drums, right? And I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. So I did the 12 songs. I had to relearn the 12 songs with Kill the Drive and then learn 25 songs with his other band and played that show. So it was uh, quite a trip, which was awesome. And then I did that trip and then came home and the following day after landing back in California, we had a details show. So I was all jet lagged, like hating on my life and playing. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and te uh, Tess, so you uh, you started writing and singing around age uh, 11, right? Did, did you kind of start building bands around then or did you do, were you just kind of finding your voice? I always wanted to be in a band. Like, uh, as soon, like I went to the dark side and I never wanted to come back. Like, I'm like, I need a band. I need, and, and I have a very specific idea of what the band would look like. We'd have our, like, as you can see, I mean, Gideon, wear matching clothes. Like we yeah. are a band, like, well, it's, it's not a, you know, not a joke. Um, So I, I was very serious like that. Um, And I had a bunch of little punk rock bands and we play graduation parties to make money. And I wrote original songs and we, you know, play covers and top 40 stuff. And um playing a bunch of clubs in Cleveland that we like should have been kicked out of for sure. But like we, we had fun and, um, but then like I went to college and I started another band and that whole band was kind of just about being drunk all the time. So I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't really need to do this. Um, and then I just took a break, but, um, finding the voice is kind of like a long-term thing. Like every year, every song, like there's something new I'm trying to figure out like whether it's um uh more places to draw from for lyrics or different types of song structures or listening to new bands that can get us um some some more tricks uh it's it's mostly always been about like discovery like what's the next thing that that can uh make this even more interesting um but yeah 11 I wrote my like a first song song at 11 um so yeah yeah. Was it a love song or what did you, <laughs> what did you... Uh, I really don't even know what it means. Like when I look yeah. back, like it's recorded, like it's on like, like, uh, like one of the first, the first little solo EP, um, it's called lines. And I literally can't even tell you, like, it was just words that sounded cool. I'm like, these words yeah. all sound okay together and the melody's fine. And I'm going to play the same four chords over and over again until I'm done. Like it was that kind of, uh, kind of song um no great thought was put into that one but then there's others that are like surprisingly mature for like that age so um yeah you have to start somewhere right so yes you do <laughs> <laughs> and uh was it's from the live component because i know uh, the live experience is important for you was there were there shows were there and was there any particular uh concert that you remember that you're like that's what I want to do. I know you mentioned seeing um, uh, Green Day, you know, on MTV, but how about a live experience to solidify that? Um, another cheesy one, because uh, I'm a, I'm I'm a young woman. I'm a woman of certain age, uh, and uh, uh, My Chemical Romance, same year, 2007, mm -hmm. came with the Black Parade tour. And I had watched like concert DVDs, like Queen's Night at the Opera with my dad and stuff and saw like what a show looks like rather than a set. Um, a set is a pile of songs and there's no rhyme, no reason. And you just kind of go up there and you play it and you leave. But like, this was like a stage play mixed with a punk club, mixed with like performance art and acting. And there was like little monologues and all the band members had like minutia between each other. like. Then I started going down this rabbit hole of like, okay, why is everybody doing the hand motions that he's doing? Like, how does that iconography happen? It's like, oh, these kids are taking videos of it and putting it on YouTube and they do it the same way every time. That's amazing. And then 
yeah, I think that show like opened up an entire world of possibilities to me um, that then my, you know, like, like older people would be like, yeah, everybody steals all that from Elvis. So then I went like mm-hmm. down the Elvis rabbit hole of like, what does a show look like? Like his residency in Las Vegas, like watching a full thing of that. He had bits with the backup singers. He had bits with the guy who brought him a towel. Like he, like he had stuff going on all over the place. And that's attention to detail because he didn't want anyone leaving that show without having a specific memory for them, you know? So um, with all that being said, I think live, I don't know. It's gotta be a show for me. It can't just be a big pile of songs. Like I, I wanna be moved. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great, and I, it's so cool that you study their you know, their their performance, their experience, how they what the, their inclinations and what they're what they're doing on stage and everything to kind of build that into what you do. And um, yeah, um, I interviewed my chemical cool romance in like '05, I think, um, at Warp Tour. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you, it was it was my worst interview. Uh, uh, because this was before smartphones, but it was the weirdest thing. I was backstage interviewing vans and stuff, and I, most of them we set up ahead of time, and so I had time to research and kind of know what, what I'm talking about. And then, you know, my chemical romance was playing, and they weren't doing interviews, but for some reason, I was signed up to do an interview with them, and I didn't set it up. And so it was it was odd. I mean, I didn't know much about about them other than they were exploding and very big. Uh, and so I, I don't know, I pulled out five minutes or something, but there were like 25 people standing around backstage taking pictures. I mean, it was weird, but uh, uh, also, but yeah, that, that was interesting moment. And um, yeah, an American Idiot too. I wanted to share a story on that. Uh, I, I saw them probably around that same, Green Day around that same time at uh, ATT Park uh, and uh, playing those the American the American Idiot songs, and then like two weeks later at the Warfield, um, and that was and the network them as the network opened it up oh, for yeah. them. So it was freaking incredible. Uh, three and a half. It was it was all, an evening. It was amazing, right? Yeah, because uh, I think the 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 thing about bands that last that I've noticed is that their songs sound the same in a stadium as they do in a club for twelve people. Like yeah. survive on an acoustic guitar and they can survive with a 20 piece orchestra. Like a good song's a good song and a tight band is a good band. So like recreating that kind of experience is like what we always aim for is like, what is our thing and how can we reproduce it every time reliably and effectively and with like spontaneity still so I think like those two bands for me did it super well. Yeah. Yeah. Fall Out Boy, we interviewed at Slims. Do you, do you, do you ever go to shows at Slims? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Close down, yeah. I miss Slims. Uh, I miss Perfect. Slims. Like, it was the first to go in COVID, and it was so disheartening. To Actually, lose. It was, uh, they closed before COVID. Uh, some other venue bought it, something, but yeah. It, 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 they were it turned gonna into, turn it into a nightclub. I think. It turned it, did, did anything come of that? I, I heard it was turning into a nightclub. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> it turned to a club called Yolo. Yeah. I don't know if it's still around. Yeah. But, uh, I'm scared, too scared to walk that street now. I don't want to look. Yeah. I know. I know. It's so sad. <laughs> I, I grew up like going to shows at Slims and everything, and like it was just a, a piece of my history. And everything. Um, what uh, for, uh getting any memorable shows for you uh that kind of helped influence you uh yeah um i don't know if you're familiar with them there's an australian band i'm a, I'm, I'm i'm a huge fan of called friends all rome rings a bell I know. No, no 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 so it's an australian band they play punk rock i think they're signed to fat records uh it's it's really it's like a good mixture of like melodic punk rock a little bit of hardcore a little bit of pop punk really technical stuff excellent musicians so they actually i don't know why those people are crazy but they toured israel they played uh two shows in israel in 2003 and they played my hometown in haifa and i remember they had the perfect balance of playing extremely well super technical stuff crazy as drummer like i'm a fan of that guy till this day but in between songs they they were like it was a stand-up comedy they were so funny they were hilarious i remember uh their guitar player was wearing a dress just for shits and giggles, you know, just to, you know, just to be weird. Um, and they made so many jokes. And yeah, it was just 
entertaining. And I didn't listen to the music up until that show. So that was one of those shows where it showed up. I didn't know what to expect. I saw that live set and then I immediately became a fan. And again, no major production, nothing crazy. Just a black room, dark room and four dudes, four Australian dudes who make so much so much fun and they're like so funny and hilarious and uh then when i got into the actual songs and the records and everything i'm like oh okay they're actually like a good band the songs are effing amazing you know um yeah. so that was awesome to me um one more experience that uh i think tess heard this story before uh one more show that really um uh influenced me was uh sync bayside which i'm sure you're familiar with okay. yeah 2007 so Bayside is a complete different animal from what I just described. Their slow, yeah. their songs are a little slower, a little heavier. They're not really a funny joke band, not super ser serious or like a, you know, a lecturing band. But they're not really jokers. And one thing that really uh, impressed me is that they played their songs five or even ten BPM slower than the record. Really? And at that point, in 2007, my go-to approach was always the faster the better play fast like if you can pull it off fast you win they played it slower and i was like slower the heavier it's cool it has a different like fact um so that was and again they played well it was awesome and i knew bayside at that point i knew their songs i knew everything i was really looking forward to that show but when i saw them and i'm like your shtick is to play tight to have really good songs but to play it a little bit slower i was like i learned something new today um, and from that moment on, every band I play in, I always make sure to not to play slower than the record, but to make sure I don't rush, to make sure like I play in the right tempo because that makes everybody's life on stage easier. And for the listener, like the audience, like it's easier to follow. If you go, the songs just get lost. So, um, yeah. 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 Um uh yeah that's i mean I, I don't know if i've seen bayside live maybe at a warp tour or something I'm, I'm sure i have back back in the day but because they've been around for a while um yeah and so tell me about kind of the uh the voyage over the last couple of years obviously uh you you all started your band in 2019 and then this little COVID thing happened and you know tell me about kind of starting a band right around that time like how do you how do you get out how do you kind of help how do you move forward with the creation of uh, of tests and the details? Um, so it's funny, we kind of didn't know we were a band until like later. Like okay. we were just kind of writing songs together and stuff. And once we kind of got into the studio for Runaway and like a few months, like a few weeks into that, we were like, oh, yeah this is a band like this is gonna have to be a band like we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do something about this and um the the this iteration of Tess and the details as it stands now is less than a year old um okay. we found our lead guitar player Dustin Galecki and our bassist Lawrence Hood and they've been amazing um but we played our first show in February of this year, um, started practicing, you know, um, uh, after the record was done, uh, when we had mixes to share with people to go, hey, like, would you be interested in in trying this? Um, and uh, we we clicked with these guys really well, and they, they share a mindset with us. And um, it's just, it's so much fun. But throughout the pandemic, we just kind of, we just kept writing. Like, writing was the thing that was like, you know, what else are we going to do? We can't play. So I was doing like the tick TikTok stuff in the background, like trying to keep the, you know, the fire burning as we're like yeah. trying to figure out what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my experience of it. Yeah. And, and getting any, any different for you or you just kind of, you're at the same spot. With yeah, it was very similar. I mean, I, I'd, I'd played in bands through all this time. Like I had bands up until COVID really, ex ex you know, erupted ex exploded became a thing whatever you define and call it uh and at that point all my bands and all my touring just disappeared like fizzled out and the, the details project is the only thing that kind of kept going because we kept writing like we do we we didn't let it stop us um so we had working on demos and, and stuff like that but after we Worked on Runaway, recorded this. This thing started taking shape. These twelve songs, we realized like, what's next? What we're gonna put it on the shelf? No, this needs to be on the stage. And that's when we connected with uh, with Dustin and Lawrence, and basically hustled. 
we're constantly hustling, constantly reaching out, constantly looking for opportunities, working with other people, other bands, booking shows, stuff like that. And that's when we got the first opportunity to play a show. And the rest was a pretty standard story. We just kept hustling and pushing the band and play more shows and reaching out to labels. And that's when we connected with Double Helix uh, through uh, a mutual friend, Yotam, uh, who also played in, in uh, Useless ID, who's also signed to Double Helix. Um, and so far, things have been moving very organically. Like the beginning of this project, project, I hate that word. The beginning of this band was weird because it was a solo project that was really shifting into a band, but then the global pandemic happened. So that stopped this, but we kept pushing however we could like online stuff like that. And then once the second it became normal to get to be in the same room again, then we finished the record. We connected with Dustin and Lawrence. We found ourselves and, you know, playing our first show. Um, so yeah. And your first show was the bottom of the hill show in February, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you played with Skating Polly. Uh, they're they're a, a cool group. Um, I've had them on a couple of times too. So how how was that experience playing with with Skating Polly at Bottom of the Hill? It was so funny because we we're you know uh, I I got this message from their uh, booking agent Margie, very sweet lady, and she is like, I'm like, is this a spam message? Like, did she mean to message this band? Because we had like 70 followers. We had no music out. Like we had like a couple of like dingy, like at our very bottom of our Instagram posts, just like bullshit. Like we just like we didn't we weren't real. Like we weren't real band. But she heard something and she was like, you guys, blah blah. Then I look them up and I'm like, these guys are huge. Like what are we? And then we get to the like we finally get to the venue and I'm like, Gideon there's a line outside there's a line of people mm -hmm. kids there's a line of kids outside and it was so loud the room was packed and we played second I fully thought we were going to play first we played second and then like as soon as these first four chords of Blondie's gonna die open bouncing I was like oh my god this is the best thing ever um so yeah our first show was a major blessing which is why we wanted to come back to bottom of the hill after you know a, a year of work um and celebrate the record release because that team there lynn and, and her entire crew is is so not only like kind and respectful but they like really care like they care about the bands that come through they care about the shows they put together they like maintain their all ages license so there's food when kids are there and like it's a really welcoming environment and it's just the best room like it's the best room in san francisco it's so much fun and uh even if like everything in the world goes wrong as long as you're on that stage you're gonna have a great time like it's just a great yeah, thing. yeah it is a cool venue and then you can even be behind it and kind of you, uh, see through the glass and everything to the to the stage it's uh it's a good place to be for sure. It's I've seen some good shows there over the years. So, and there's kitty um, cats in the backyard sometimes. It's sometimes the cats in, in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's a good place. And and Gideon, you had a a good experience there as well. Always, I love Bottom of the Hill. So first time I I actually been to Bottom of the Hill was in 2007. I played in Kill the Drive. We toured the U.S. for the first time, and uh, I went there to see No Use for a Name flatliners and whole wheat bread and i remember waiting outside the venue and i saw it was, it was so surreal i saw fat mike and a bunch of people in band joey, joey kip and a bunch of people in bands that i grew up admiring like having you know having drink not drinks but having a laugh outside like smoking i was like you know it's so surreal and after moving to the u.s 2016 joined other bands played a few shows in bottom of the hill i'm like i'm still can believe that I am fortunate enough to play shows there. Like, yeah. obviously there are bigger stages, bigger festivals, bigger opportunities. F all those things. Bottom of the hill, best venue on earth. Like, swear to God, in my book, number one. So the fact that we're playing there next week. Mind blown, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's pretty cool. My favorite, I'm, I'm partial to the Fillmore. I have, uh, you know, that it's just there's so much history there. You can get lost in the posters on the walls and oh, yeah. it's it's incredible, right? I mean, there's just an energy. Uh, they There used to even be magic in the apples. They've recently changed the uh, the apples to just generic whatever apples and they're not the same. It's just not, it's not the same. And uh, <laughs> I know that, that seems petty, but... 
uh, about the details. It's it's about the in a, you, you get it. You get the details. And so, yes, t- tell me about the details of pulling together your your live show. What is what do you have in store for uh, for next week? What does that look like? Hmm. Uh, we like to call it a circus. Uh, it's like part circus, part stand up slapstick routine, part uh, stadium rock show in a club. Um, we just like to have a lot of fun. And um, like I was saying before, like we don't play piles of songs. Um, everything is choreographed and uh, thought out and there's transitions and fun things that appear live that don't appear on the record. And um, we just want everyone to have a good time. So like when, when you come to a detail show, we hope that... Um, you just enjoy yourself and you can like let your day-to-day go and let whatever's going on in your life go and just have a blast like jump up and down um laugh at us laugh with us like it's 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 a good time so um our live show is my favorite thing to work on i love writing love recording love being in the studio but like there's just something about like when you get on stage and you're looking out at people and if they like it just seeing seeing the moment where like their wheels start turning like what yeah. song or what lyric or like what put like sometimes people are right away like just jumping up and down you're like, okay but I always look for the guy in the back that's like not quite paying attention and I'm like I want him like I want uh-huh. that person to turn around I want that guy so um I don't know if you're a discerning critic come see us play because uh I think mm-hmm. you'll have a good time you're, you're focused on that one person. It's like I always hear comedians say they're focused on the person who's not laughing. You don't want to make them laugh and everything, right? And yeah, you yeah. just you want to reach everybody. So that's a that's a good way to do it. And uh, we're not, and I we're wish not, I could. Okay, we're not one of those bands that are like calling the crowd to come, come closer, come closer. We're like, <laughs> fuck off, that guy, come here. Yeah, Get over here. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I, w- I wish I could be there. I'm I'm roped into Cookies with Santa at my son's school. That uh, he's, he's he even keeps asking me. He even asked me about it today. I'm like, yeah, I I, uh, I will be there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> well, if Santa's if, if Santa's asleep by ten o'clock, we're playing we're playing a little later. So I just put him down and drive. I'm, I'm in Vacaville, so I'm like a, a little ways away. But uh, <laughs> it's harder to get your shows now. With I have two kids, and it's just it's harder. It's harder. I was to say that. So, but uh, but I enjoy talking to you, uh, you all like this. So it's fun. Um, okay, so uh, as we get into the holidays, what do you have planned for the holidays? What does that look like for you both? Uh, I'm going to be writing more songs, probably. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. spending decomp- some time with family. There, yeah. there you go. Decompressing from this year and ge- ge- gearing up for next year. Like we're, like like mentioned earlier, we're always working. We're always hustling. We're always looking for more stuff we can do. So uh, even when we, we go on vacations and we travel and stuff like that, the wheels are always spinning. We're always like online, you know, um, in conversations trying to set up stuff uh for our band for next time so uh yeah it's going to be a mixture of that like decompressing for from uh the release show and uh gearing up for 2024 that's a good way to do it and uh and you're working on a west coast tour yeah yeah We've got some irons in the fire. We have a couple dates so far. We have one in Santa Cruz coming up with oh, Swinging nice. Utters, which is going to be really fun. Um, and then we're going down to Los Angeles. Um, so we're working on a couple things and um, some surprises. So it should be a really, really fun uh, start to the year. I like it. I like it. Well, Tess Gideon, thank you for taking the time today. I uh, really appreciate it and uh, enjoyed enjoyed learning about your rise to to where we are now. I wish you the best of luck at the Bottom of the Hill show as well and uh, the other shows coming up. And uh, I say, I guess I'll say happy holidays too. So <laughs> you too. Thanks so <laughs> well, thank much. You. That was the interview with Tess and the details here on Concert Pipeline, and that takes us to the final segment of the program, the music news. <laughs> a couple stories to wind out the program today (coughs) gotta get that cough out first though Uh, okay uh first up guns and roses are streaming a new single the general um they debuted their new single uh with geffen records that stands out as the band's second release of 2023 they're making new music 
you don't see a lot of these classic rock bands making new music. So, uh, it, it, or if they do, it's very, very slow to come out. So for Guns N' Roses to be released two songs this year, that's pretty exciting. And this follows their summer single, Perhaps. Uh, they initially debuted the general to a sold out hometown audience during their two night stand at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles. And fans have anxiously awaited the, this song coming out. Uh, the Guns N' Roses completed their Blockbuster 2023 World Tour last month, sold 1.3 million tickets around the world, and it marked the band's la largest run to date and consisted of acclaimed performances across European stadiums uh, and arenas and included headlining festivals uh, in a lot of different locations. Um, Guns N' Roses is, is doing the thing, right? Like they've they found their groove and they're getting after it. Uh, so congratulations to uh, to um, Guns N' Roses on uh, on releasing their new new single. So, um, all right, let's talk uh, here. Actually, I lost a couple of my stories. That's that's weird. Uh, so, one second. Okay, so uh, some forty one Derek's Wibley. Uh, he had um, he had some challenges here. Let me. Where is this song? He's been. He's been on a, a bumpy roller coaster of a ride recently, um, and he had a very long, uh, wide-ranging conversation. He opened up to GQ about nearly dying from COVID in se September, which uh, uh, what it was like dating Paris Hilton and Avril Lavigne, and why some forty-one is breaking up after three raucous decades. He said uh, he's a little bit beat. He barely slept uh, the night before. He's really having a lot of challenges and. Um, and he, uh, he said that, um, he's, he's just right. He's cleaning up a lot, uh, ultimately. So he's trying to uh, fix a lot of what's going on in his life and, and make things better. And he's been making music with some 41 for 27 years. Uh, and I guess it's time for, for that to come to an end. Uh, but, the, his rise with COVID and then he had pneumonia afterwards. He's, uh, he just wrapped a 28 day uh, tour with the offspring. So that was uh, um, a whirlwind ride also. And, uh, and he's had a lot going on. So uh, that is some 41. Um, Brandon Flowers was teasing some um, intimate hot fuzz, uh, hot, excuse me, hot fuss 20th anniversary shows uh, recently in an interview. Their, that was their debut LP. It was released on June 7, 2004 and featured uh, Smile Like You Mean It, Somebody Told Me, All These Things That I've Done, uh, uh, and Mr. Brightside, among others. So many hits on that album, and it's been 20 years. He spoke to Zane Lowe on Apple Music Radio, and uh, he, um, he says he's got 20 more years in him, and the um, uh, flower said, we are planning maybe some anniversary shows, which uh, I wish I could t uh, tell more. So uh, they're good figuring something out there. And then he, he's talking about these anniversary dates and he said, oh, they're fucking here. I won't say anything. They're small. You know, one of these is fucking small. Dude, bro, I might uh, uh, have to come out. I mean, oh, that was... Uh, um, I mean, these are small venues, pretty much, that he's saying. It's going to be really intimate, probably really hard to get tickets. Um, but they uh, want to make a record also. Uh, they have a lot that they're, they're working on. So that's the, the killers. Um, okay. Uh, Shane uh, McGowan. We lost Shane McGowan. Uh, and if you don't know who Shane McGowan is, uh, he was the um, front man. Uh, uh, I'm going to read a letter, uh, letter from... Dave King actually, but is the um, you know, Dave King from Flogging Molly who, uh, to kind of talk about his relationship with um, with Shane Mc, uh, McGowan. But there's been a lot of tributes to to Shane McGowan and the impact that he had on uh, on music. Um, he was the former fr Pogues frontman. He died from pneumonia in um, a hospital at the age of 65 on November 30th, uh, and he's been really ill recently. Uh, and so there, uh, Nick Cave, Aiden Gillen, and Johnny Depp lead to the tribute to Shane McGowan at his funeral. Uh, and his wife, uh, Victoria Mae Clark, also paid homage by presenting the context of symbols. Uh, they had a really touching tribute, but um, I was touched by uh, what Dave King of Flog Molly did because a lot of their 
uh, what they've done. They have, you know, to thank the the, uh, the Pogues, really. So Dave King got on social media, which he's never done. He said, dear friends, this is my first time to write or post on social media, but the sad news last week has compelled me to do so. Uh, so bear with me. He wrote a, a long letter. Um, but um, he said to many, Shane McGowan was a rebel punk, a snaggletooth genius, one of the greatest songwriters of a generation, the voice of the forgotten, and the soul of Irish music. He was, of course, all of those things, but he was also a savior. Um, so we went on to talk about what, how Shane McGowan was a, a savior. Um, and uh, he said Shane's lyrics uh, sang and brought much needed comfort, but the most of all, they gave me something I hadn't felt in a long time hope i picked up my guitar and started writing again but this time it was different i was going to write songs for me myself and uh, i didn't give a fuck what anyone uh, thought about them above any everything i wanted to continue what those great artists and bands have taught me uh, that uh, in all its essence irish music was and always will be punk rock uh, from generation to generation, there were times when music was all that we Irish had. Reflecting on that history filled me with a passion to deliver it as best I could to a new generation uh, and to every corner of the globe, just like those who came before had, had done. He ended with, thank you, Shane. Uh, long may your voice and inspiration soar through our hearts, now left broken. Uh, Dave from uh, Flog and Molly. Um, uh, uh, so uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, next and I believe last story is uh, Bleachers de uh, debuted a video for their song Ultimator uh, with uh, Lana Del Rey. Uh, Jack, it's a video with Jack Antonoff from Bleachers taking a, a night drive through Weird Jersey. Uh, and uh, Lana Del Rey and Margaret Qualley made cameos in the uh, latest visual for Bleacher, for the Bleacher's vid video. Uh, and so it was directed by Alex Lockett. Uh, take, uh, it was Jack Antonoff taking an evening drive through New Jersey, uh, including a saxophone playing construction worker uh, and a religious zealot with a Kill Your Idol sign, a nod to the song's lyrics. Lana Del Rey contributes vocals to the single. Uh, she pops up through, uh, throughout in, in an almost ghostly manner while Antonoff's wife, Margaret Qualley, I didn't know uh, who his wife was, actually. Margaret Qualley. Um, I'm not sure who she is, uh, but who, who's, who is Margaret Qualley? Uh, I mean, other than Jack Antonoff's wife. Um, I know he's had some high profile relationships in the, in the past. She's an American actress. actress. She, oh, she was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and, and The Nice Guys um, and a, I guess a show called Made. Uh, so uh, that's cool. Um, and yeah, they appear and Margaret Qualley appears on a street corner in the final moments of the video and in a release uh, bleachers on, uh, on March 8th of 2024 uh, has been, they're releasing their album then. It's been described as being Antonoff's distinctly New Jersey take on the bizarre sensory contradictions of modern life, on his position in culture, and on the things he cares about. Sonically, it's sad, joyous, it's music for uh, driving on the highway to and crying for and dancing to at weddings. Um, so, New music coming from Bleachers. Um, I'll be honest, it's been a couple years since I've been excited about a Bleachers album. Uh, their debut album was brilliant. It was a work of art. It's high on my list of favorite albums. Uh, their second album was decent. And then the ones after that, I'll buy them. I'll, buy, I'll even buy uh, CD copies, you know, uh, sometimes. I mean, I don't really have a CD player anymore, but just to have the physical piece of it because I'm a Bleachers fan, um, I'll buy it. But uh, but I don't listen to it like I listen to Bleacher's debut album, um, which is incredible. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but they have new music and I will listen to it. Um, all right. That is our show for today. Uh, I want to thank Tess and the details for being on the program. Uh, don't have anything else set right now in, in terms of anything lined up, but uh, we might sneak one more episode in before the end of the year. We'll see how, see what happens. Um, if not, I'm sure I'll do an episode 
uh, uh, at the beginning of the year to cover this something corporate show uh, down in Anaheim that I'm going to be going to with my daughter Fern. Really, really looking forward to that end of year show and the uh, experience that, that goes along with it. So that's going to come. And along with that, uh, also, uh, I recommend checking out a podcast called Something in the Wilderness. Uh, it is a, um, a, a guy named Steve also, who is a big fan of uh, Andrew McMahon and his music and breaks down um, uh, a different song in each episode of his podcast, sometimes covers live shows as well, uh, uh, talks through the live experience of going to Andrew's shows. It's all about Andrew McMahon's music. And I've, I'll say I've learned a lot about his music by listening to that podcast. Um, and I thought I was a really big Andrew McMahon fan, but uh, but this other Steve really breaks down and goes deep into Andrew's music and it's really cool to hear uh, I'm going to be on that show talking about um, an Andrew, uh, one of something corporate songs and uh, also the concert uh, down in Anaheim so you can check that out okay that's our show for today thank you for tuning in for all of us here at Concert Pipeline I'm Steve Jones we'll catch you next time